Hi, and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about sample rates and oversampling. Why do we need oversampling options in Dynamics plugins like compressors and limiters, or saturators like Satin? And would it be better to just run a higher project sample rate instead? But let's start with a general chat about resolution. I grew up watching standard definition TV, which here in the UK meant an image size of 720 by 576. Honestly, it seemed fine to me at the time. But compared to modern HD video with 1920 pixels by 1080, the differences are obvious and easy to see. Audio standards have also evolved since my youth. CDs use a sample rate of 44.1 kHz and store each sample with 16 bits of resolution. Modern high-resolution audio at 96 kHz and 24 bits might seem like it should yield as big an improvement over CD audio as HD video provides over standard definition. But it's not quite as simple as that. We're looking here at a 100 Hz sine wave in SoundForge, and what we're seeing is a graph of how the speaker will move when I play back this test tone. Let's zoom in so we can see the individual samples. Each of these is connected with a straight line, but there are enough of the samples in each cycle that when I zoom out, it looks like a perfectly smooth sine wave. And when I press play, sure enough, we hear a clean, pure sine tone. Now let's look in another sine wave, this one right up at 10 kHz. When we zoom in on this, it looks awful. Nothing at all like a sine wave. As our sample rate is 48 kHz, we barely have two sample points for each half of the cycle and the smooth curves of the sine wave have become harsh, jagged spikes. It seems logical to conclude that this isn't going to sound like a pure sine wave. And it also seems logical to conclude that if we increased the sample rate so that we had more sample points in between these current ones, we would get closer to a pure sine wave. Now, a 10k test tone is never going to sound pleasant, but when I play this back at a level that doesn't hurt my ears, Actually, that sounds like a pure sine wave to me. Because in fact, most audio editors and DAWs don't really tell you the truth when you're zoomed in this tight. Joining the dots with straight lines is fast and efficient, and works fine in most cases. But it's not what will happen when the signal is converted to analog. In fact, these dots will be connected with a smooth curve. And not just any smooth curve. There's actually only one mathematically correct curve that can be drawn through these points without breaking the golden rule, which I'll come to in a moment. I can show you this by switching to a different audio editor. Acoustica from Acon Digital is unusual in that it does display the wave as it will look after reconstruction. As we can see, even with not much more than two sample points for each half of the wave, this is enough information to recreate a perfectly smooth sine wave. We can go further. Here's a 20 kHz sine wave and we now have barely more than a single sample for each half of the wave. But this is still enough information to recreate a perfect sine wave. But we're close to the limit now. If the frequency of this sine wave increases so that we have less than one sample for each half of the wave, it all suddenly falls apart. If the signal can oscillate from positive to negative and back again between two sample points, then that entire negative half of the waveform gets lost. The decoder will see two adjacent positive samples and will reconstruct this incorrectly as a much lower frequency signal. This is the golden rule I referred to earlier. A digital system can represent all frequencies perfectly, as long as they're less than half the sample rate. As 20 kHz is less than half the CD standard sample rate of 44.1 kHz, CD resolution audio is quite capable of recreating a 20 kHz sine wave. If we increase the sample rate, let's say to 96 kHz. Now I can represent frequencies right up to 48 kHz. But this 20 kHz sine wave isn't reproduced with any greater accuracy. 20 kHz is usually considered to be the upper limit of human hearing. But in fact, most people lose their ability to hear that high before reaching adulthood. I'm not ashamed to admit that I can't hear this 20 kHz tone at all. <laughs> 
So if a CD standard sample rate of 44.1 kHz is already enough to reproduce the entire range of frequencies that we can hear, why would we ever want to use a higher sample rate? For consumer formats, there's actually not much benefit. Some people argue that those higher frequencies can make an audible difference, even though we don't hear them in the conventional sense. But it's kind of academic anyway. Most consumer speaker systems can't reproduce frequencies higher than 20 kHz, and most consumers don't care. And there is another issue, which I'll demonstrate with some test tones again. Here's a 7 kHz sine wave shown on an analyzer, where it shows up as a single pure frequency. Now here's another sine wave at 25 kHz. I've set my system sample rate to 96 kHz, so this sine wave can be represented perfectly, even though we can't hear it. Let's add both sine waves together. In the perfectly linear and distortion-free world of a DAW, this happens perfectly. We get a 7 kHz sine wave that we can hear, plus a 25 kHz sine wave that we can't hear, and the two don't affect one another at all. Now let's add some subtle saturation. Here's an instance of Saturn running the gentle saturation algorithm, which adds just odd harmonics. Adding this to the 7 kHz sine wave, we see a third harmonic appear at 21 kHz. Now let's add in the 25 kHz sine wave as well. And notice the extra partials that appear due to intermodulation between the two sine waves. These are well below 20 kHz and could be audible if they're loud enough. Of course, a real world signal will be much more complex than these two sine waves. So let's swap the higher sine wave for some white noise, brick wall filtered to remove everything below 24 kHz. When we add saturation, the noise starts to intermodulate itself and spread down into the audible range. But now notice what happens when I add the lower 7 kHz sine wave. That high frequency content is now spread out over the whole frequency range. What this means is that unless your playback system is 100% linear and free of any distortion whatsoever, then having extra inaudible content above 20 kHz simply means you'll have more unwanted intermodulation below 20 kHz. If you band limit the signal by removing the inaudible content above 20 kHz, you might actually end up with a cleaner, better quality result. But the situation is a bit different when you're producing, specifically if you're using non-linear plugins like saturators or compressors. I've generated a sine wave sweep for the next demonstration. In this spectral display, it shows as a diagonal line starting at 20 Hz and sweeping up to 20 kHz. Now let's distort this with the warm tape saturation style in Saturn. I'm going to keep this really subtle with the drive knob all the way down. This adds a third harmonic, which rises faster than the original sine wave, as you would expect. When it reaches the Nyquist limit at half the sample rate, in this case 24 kHz, it can't continue to increase in frequency. But it doesn't just disappear. Instead, it reflects back down as a uniquely digital form of distortion called aliasing. This aliased signal is no longer harmonically related to the original sine wave, so it can sound unmusical and harsh. And it keeps sweeping down until it reaches zero hertz, at which point it reflects back up again, so it can easily end up at a lower frequency than the original signal. OK, now let's try the same thing, but with our sample rate set to 96 kHz instead of 48 kHz. Here's the sine wave sweep. The vertical scale now goes all the way up to 48k, so when the sweep reaches 20k, it's less than halfway up. Let's saturate it again. Now our third harmonic has a whole extra octave of headroom before it reaches the Nyquist limit and reflects back down. But actually, we then get another octave above that, where the resulting aliasing is above 20 kHz and can be considered inaudible. When the original sweep reaches 20 kHz, the aliased third harmonic is still up at 36 kHz. So doubling the sample rate has actually given us two extra octaves of headroom for our saturation to add harmonics without audible aliasing. 
when we're only adding a third harmonic, this is enough to completely fix the problem. But this was a very subtle saturation setting. Let's try switching to heavy saturation instead, then add a little bit of drive, and try the same test. And that's a bit of a mess. This time we're adding a whole harmonic series, which increase in frequency rapidly, hit the Nyquist limit, and then spend the rest of the sweep merrily bouncing from top to bottom and back again. This might look pretty, but it doesn't sound much like analog distortion. Notice those strange chirping sounds as the harmonics sweep rapidly in the wrong directions. If we try this at 96 kHz, it's certainly better. That chirping is much quieter. But it's still there, and the aliasing is still clearly visible. So simply doubling the sample rate isn't good enough in this case. We could go to 192 kilohertz. Again, it's a lot better. Remember that only the bottom quarter of this graph is actually audible now. But while many of you will have interfaces capable of running at 192 kilohertz, it's not a very practical solution to the issue. All your plugins will require four times the CPU compared to a 48 kilohertz project, even the ones that don't benefit at all from a higher sample rate and all your recordings will be four times the size. And you haven't even completely solved the problem. So let's revert to a 48 kHz sample rate, but this time turn on HQ mode in Saturn. This enables internal oversampling, so the audio is upsampled to eight times the original rate, then saturated at that sample rate. Everything above 24 kHz then gets filtered out before the sample rate is dropped back down to the original rate of 48 kHz. The result is harmonics that extend up to Nyquist and then stop, more or less. These tiny little bits of reflection get filtered out well before they reach down to 20 kHz. So now we have a distortion effect that behaves much more like analog distortion. Here's an easy way to create audible aliasing. I've got a clean sine wave patch in Twin 2 which I'm playing up in the higher registers. And I'm going to distort this with the heavy saturation style in Saturn. I'm not going to be shy, let's crank the drive all the way up. If we watch the result on ProQ3's analyzer, it's easy to see the harmonic series that we've added extends up to the Nyquist limit and then reflects back down again as aliasing. This sounds brittle and metallic, as if we've added subtle ring modulation. The effect becomes especially noticeable if I use the pitch wheel to bend notes. Now those reflected harmonics sweep in the wrong direction, creating distinctive chirpy sounds. And likewise if I add vibrato. Let's try doubling the sample rate to 96 kHz which is really the highest that's practical in most cases. If I play an E, it's easy to see that the aliased harmonics now reflect down from a point an octave higher than before. But in this admittedly contrived and extreme example, we can still hear chirping artifacts when I bend notes or add vibrato. If I switch back to a 48 kilohertz sample rate, and enable HQ mode in Saturn instead, we get much purer sounding harmonics with vastly reduced aliasing and no chirpy artifacts. So we can see that when applying a lot of hard distortion to a high frequency signal, the eight times oversampling provided by Saturn's HQ mode is much more effective than running a higher project sample rate. So what about compression? This also generates extra harmonics. The faster the attack and release times, the closer compression comes to being a distortion effect. But modulating the signal at audio rates also creates sidebands, which I can demonstrate with a sine wave again. Here's a static sine wave that I'm running through a compressor. But I'm driving the side chain of the compressor with a drum loop. So the sine wave is modulated in level in the same way as the drums would be if I were compressing those. 
Let's look at the result on ProQ3's analyzer. When the sine wave is static, we see it as a single pure frequency, as you'd expect. But when it's being modulated by the drums, extra partials start to appear above and below the sine wave. With very fast and aggressive compressor settings, these partials extend higher and lower. But even with fairly normal settings, there's still significant content either side of the original sine wave. When this compression is applied to a drum track, with cymbals extending right up into the highest octave, this extra content can end up too high and result in aliasing. Which is why Pro-C2 also provides oversampling options. This time, rather than a single HQ option, we have a choice of two times or four times oversampling. Doubling the sample rate should be enough in most cases, but aggressive settings might benefit from four times oversampling. However, this isn't completely free. Pro-C2 uses linear phase oversampling filters, which add extra latency and an extra CPU hit, which comes on top of the cost of running the processing at two or four times the rate. Saturn uses minimum phase filters, which result in much less latency, but adds some phase shift instead. So what about a scenario where multiple, more subtle nonlinear stages are running in series? Like, for example, these drums. This is a multi-track drum loop, and I've processed each channel in the usual kind of way, with noise gates, compressors, EQs and saturators. Then the whole lot goes into a subgroup for more saturation and compression. Each of these individual processes is relatively gentle, and would probably only require two times oversampling to avoid aliasing. So in this case, perhaps it's better to run the project at 96 kHz, so that each plugin in the chain doesn't have to continually upsample and downsample again. In order to examine that concept, I'm going to switch to guitar. This is a Les Paul that I DI'd through a clean preamp. Starting at the end of my plugin chain, here's a Pro-Q3 with a setting that I EQ matched from a guitar cabinet impulse, which represents my speaker cabinet. Before that in the chain, I have a Saturn with a warm tube setting and just a little touch of compression. This represents the power amp stage. Before that, I have another instance of Saturn to represent the preamp stage provided on most modern guitar amps. And before that, I have another instance of Saturn running in heavy saturation mode to emulate a distortion pedal. If that seems a little overkill, it's not really. Many guitarists will chain two or even three overdrive or distortion pedals before an amp that's itself not entirely clean, with each pedal adding a touch more dirt and boosting the level into the next overdrive stage. Actually, I also have a pair of Pro Q3 instances either side of this first instance of Saturn to shape the signal before and after the distortion. With these bypassed, it sounds too much like a fuzz pedal. Turning them back on sounds much more like the Boss distortion pedal I had when I was 14. I'm running the project sample rate at 96 kHz, with no oversampling for any of the saturation stages. And let's make it easier to analyse what's happening by swapping the guitar for a sine wave test tone. Let's have this somewhere around 4 kHz to represent the most prominent parts of the upper mid-range. And now let's add the first saturation stage. This is a hard distortion type, close to clipping in response. So we get a lot of harmonics, and it's easy to push this into aliasing, even at 96 kHz. But the 4 kHz components of the original guitar DI signal are not very high in level, so the aliased components below 20 kHz are likely to be very low in level and probably not significant. So running at 96 kHz instead of 44.1 or 48 is probably enough to prevent aliasing being a problem. But that extra octave of headroom we've gained from the higher sample rate is now full of content. We've got harmonics up there now, plus aliased harmonics that are too high to be audible. When this signal hits the next non-linearity, in this case my virtual preamp stage, there's no headroom anymore. Those higher partials are going to grow more harmonics, which will immediately alias. And perhaps worse, we'll get intermodulation between those higher partials and the audible content lower down. I can make it easier to distinguish the wanted harmonics from aliasing 
by adding a very subtle slow vibrato to the original sine wave. This is too subtle to be noticeable for the original sine wave and its harmonics, but the reflected aliasing and sidebands from intermodulation with that aliasing now sweep around instead of remaining static. Of course, when we add the third nonlinear stage, the aliasing and intermodulation from the first two stages will interact with everything else again, and we'll get yet more aliasing and yet more intermodulation. If we go up to 192 kilohertz, the aliasing is much improved for the first saturation stage. And the second saturation stage is probably okay now too. But we're still filling up those extra octaves of headroom that we've gained from increasing the sample rate. And sooner or later, there'll be aliasing and intermodulation down in the audible range. What we actually need to make this setup work better is some filtering. If we remove the extra high frequency content after each nonlinear stage with a steep brick wall low pass filter, then the next nonlinear stage will be processing a band limited signal with no inaudible high frequency content and will benefit from all the extra high frequency bandwidths that the higher sample rate provides. When you're running multiple nonlinear stages in series, you'll actually get better, cleaner results by band limiting the signal between each stage. So we fixed the aliasing issue. But consider how inefficient this setup is. The static EQ settings either side of the first nonlinear stage are using four times the CPU, as will all the other EQs in your project. And we need an extra two steep low pass filters in the chain. Now let's try dropping the sample rate back to 48 kilohertz and running each instance of Saturn in HQ mode instead. Now each instance of Saturn upsamples the input signal eight times, applies its processing with an internal sample rate of 384 kilohertz, then filters out the harmonics higher than 20 kilohertz when downsampling. This means we don't need to run extra brick wall filters. These are included in the oversampling anyway. And the EQs running either side of the first instance, and indeed all the other EQs in your project, we'll no longer have to pointlessly process four times as many samples as needed. This is not just more efficient than increasing the project sample rate, it's also more effective at reducing aliasing. Of course, it's important to keep all of this in perspective, as in most cases, aliasing remains subtle and difficult to hear. So let's create a listening test. Here's the multi-track drum loop I used earlier with compression and saturation, both on individual channels and the subgroup. Let's add some bass from Twin2, with some saturation, compression, and more saturation. And a Twin2 chord part, with a couple more saturation stages. And let's have a few guitars as well, all DI'd through multiple instances of Saturn. All these then go through a subgroup with more saturation and compression. And then join the drums in the master bus. Let's start with the project sample rate at 44.1 kHz and no oversampling for any of the plugins. Now let's switch the sample rate to 96 kHz. I've sample rate converted all the drums and guitar tracks using a high quality offline converter. But the synths are now generating 96 kHz audio. Notice how this twin two part now fills up that extra octave of bandwidth at the top. So it will start to alias as soon as it hits a non-linearity. Of course, you'll still be listening to this at 44.1 kHz, as that's the rate YouTube runs at. But I'll convert this audio using the same high quality offline converter so you're hearing this as accurately as possible. Okay, now let's switch back to 44.1 kHz, but with HQ mode turned on for all instances of Saturn, and four times oversampling in every instance of Pro C2. Can you hear the difference? 
Before I leave you, let's quickly look at the difference between 44.1 kHz and 48 kHz. It might seem like the difference is negligible, so you might as well run at 44.1 kHz for music productions and avoid any need to convert the sample rate at the mastering stage. But let's take another look at the anti-aliasing filters. At 44.1 kHz, these have to be extremely steep in order to remove everything above 22.05 kHz without affecting a signal at 20 kHz. If I switch to a 48 kHz sample rate, however, these filters can be somewhat less severe, as they now only have to remove content above 24 kHz, and they've got twice as much room to work in. In this respect, you could say that 48 kHz is twice as good as 44.1 kHz. This might be why many pros choose to track and mix at 48 kHz instead of 44.1. A negligible increase in CPU load and file size means every plugin that uses internal oversampling can relax the filters slightly. Of course, the Fab Filter guys know how to make good quality, transparent oversampling filters, and you are unlikely to hear any side effects when you turn it on. But if the signal is upsampled and downsampled half a dozen times by a chain of plugins, perhaps the differences accumulate. So here's my little test mix running at 44.1 kHz again, with oversampling turned on for all plugins. And now here it is rendered at 48 kHz, then converted offline afterwards. So let's try to form a conclusion. The original proposition, sample rates, the higher the better, right, is clearly wrong. Higher sample rates do nothing to improve the quality of audible content below 20 kHz, and can result in lower quality due to increased intermodulation. Higher sample rates only provide any benefit when using nonlinear processes that can add extra harmonics above Nyquist. But in this case, it's usually better to oversample each nonlinear stage individually rather than just increase the project sample rate. However, aliasing is actually likely to be inaudible in most cases, even without oversampling. If you have plugins that technically should oversample but don't, that doesn't mean they're useless. And if your processor can't keep up with the scale of your ambition when you oversample every plugin, turn off oversampling before you scale back your ambition. Because at the end of the day, if it sounds good, it is good. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.